As Katie mentioned, lots of food for thought also for the cluster meetings and we'll have more time of course throughout the day and, and tomorrow to digest and discuss some of the thought-provoking uh, inputs uh, we received this morning. It's now my great pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, a European friend, Juan Carlos de Martin, uh, who will moderate the next uh, panel, which actually builds, I think, uh, very much on, on, on the first one. Uh, Juan Carlos um, is a, a professor at the Politecnico uh, di Torino, uh, where he also leads the Nexa Center for Internet and Society, which is a sister center of the Berkman Center. <coughs> Um, Juan Carlos and his team have been fantastic collaborators over many years and it's Thank always you. a pleasure to welcome him back on campus. Thank you. Uh, he just spent a few months here in Cambridge and we're delighted to have you back and uh, thanks for moderating this facilitators panel. Over to you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you Urs, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, we are uh, facing this uh, second roundtable is going to look at the perspective of the facilitators, therefore the educators that uh, not only use, but as we heard, reuse and co-create uh, open educational resources. Now the format of this uh, roundtable is uh, like the first one, therefore I will give just a few brief, int brief introduction of the panelists that are somewhere in the audience. And um, I will offer a few remarks, introductory remarks. Then our panelists will have five minutes to make their point. And then we will have a conversation. Hopefully we will be on time so that we can involve you also at least for a few minutes in the conversation. And let me tell you who are our panelists. Uh, we are not sitting in the empty chair. They are somewhere in the first, line, in first rows of the audience. Katie Kessely, the CEO of Creative Commons. Here she is. Here they are. Welcome. It's nice to have you here on the front, front row. So starting from my, my left, uh, uh, John Bergman, one of the pioneers of the flipped class movement, he wrote a book on the flipped class, write a blog on all things flipped, and he will tell us what that means. Manages a network of 3,000 3, educators flipping their classes. In 2010, semi-finalist for Colorado Teacher of the Year, and awarded in 2003 the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching. Welcome. Uh, sitting next to him is Katie Kesserle, CEO of Creative Commons. Nice to meet you, nice finally. Nice to meet you, finally. <laughs> and uh, she's been involved in openness, and particularly in uh, education for a long time. As director of the OER initiative, the Youth Foundation, she managed the investments totaling more than 100 million to harness the efficiency and effect effectiveness of knowledge sharing worldwide. And uh, sitting uh, over there on the left is Alex Kozak, works for Google public policy covering education and copyright policy. He also comes from Creative Commons and experience there. And with a focus on educational resources and metadata, is now a technical consultant with Wikiworks, a semantic media wiki consulting group. And I have a thing to say about semantic web and open educational resources. Now, uh, the kind of questions that we're going to address during this panel are the questions uh, that you can imagine like uh, uh, what are the experiences of educators with OER in different settings? Um, do they find it useful? Are there drawbacks? Are enhancing or uh, enabling good <laughs> teaching? Uh, will, my observation will be specifically on what we mean by good teaching. Are there, what are the primary obstacles using OER? Is, are they cultural, are they institutional, they are personal, what are the obstacles? So these are the kind of questions that uh, we are going to address first in the five minutes presentation and then in the ensuing conversation. But before giving the floor to the panelists, allow me an observation about a specific point that uh, interests um, personally me. And uh, actually it's an observation, but there will going to be a preceding uh, micro observation. The micro observation is that uh, um, it seems to me as an engineer, I'm a computer engineer, that semantic web technologies have a specific potential for open educational resources. Seems to me, even without at all being an expert in the field from the technical point of view, is that semantic web seems to be the right tool to find what we are looking for in this complex heterogeneous uh, uh, pool of resources to find similarities between different resources that seem apparently different, but indeed they are similar. So I would love to hear from, maybe from Alex or from some, some people in the audience what they think about if there are already specific research projects about semantic web and open educational resources. 
that was the micro observation. The observation, which is not that larger, is that um, it's uh, quite clear, even though we try not to think of ourselves as always different from the past, but it's quite clear that we are living in a moment where there is a, an enormous emphasis on teaching innovation. Uh, so diff ways of doing things differently than before. Of course, uh, innovation in education is centuries old. So think about Comenius and Rousseau, Pestalozzi and Dewey and so on. So for centuries, people have been thinking about how to innovate in education. But I think it's safe to say that we're living right now in these years a specific strong emphasis on doing things differently, that is to innovate. Now, the reasons for this specific uh, new emphasis or enhanced em emphasis it seems to be that I can see at least three different causes. One is um, uh, that digital technology itself begs for innovation. It's particularly uh, an innovative platform. It's much easier. It's more flexible than previous educational technologies. So it seems to me that te te digital technology itself is like asking for innovation. The second causes are social, uh, particularly a mix of potential causes. Uh, there is a long strand, historical strand of critique of the educational system that came out of the Industrial Revolution. So looking at the, the uh, standardized education as a consensus machine, molding minds to preserve the status quo, and that's a long strand. And from that strand of thought, uh, demands and offer of, of education, uh, innovation in education has come out and they're still coming out. And um, the second that we heard so clearly from the Joe Ito keynote is that we have a net generation that is used to individual personalized uh, trajectories of, uh, of education and uh, they are just want to replicate that even in the institutions of education, the standards ed institutions. Uh, the third point is that um, of the social uh, mix of social causes is that uh, our societies are becoming more and more competitive, both at the individual level and also among nations, and therefore we are looking for an edge. And we all think that education is an important instrument for being, having a competitive advantage, and this demand for being competitive is, is causing a demand for innovation. Finally, a third cause, besides the digital technology and the social factors, is that there is an increasing pressure to contain educational cost in the US and in Europe, although for, with a different framework and different uh, needs. And therefore, this demand to contain cost is also asking for new ways of doing things, saving money and potentially doing even better than before. And the somewhat related is that uh, there is a clear um, view that education could be a, a new market, and therefore, as we all know, startups and other entrepreneurial activities are starting to enter the field because there, it's a potential new market. So my, my contribution to the conversation after your presentations is that maybe we need to devote at least some time thinking about the relationship between open education resources and teaching innovation how open educational resources should be to favor different kinds of innovation. Uh, do, they, do we have specific needs? Do we have to do something to facilitate this connection between teaching innovation and open educational resources? Now, this, even my observation is over, so I can give, uh, should we go in this order? Yes, what about uh, listening then to, to John and his presentation? Well, I'm John Dorgan, and I also am a teacher, so I have to stand up. So, um, <laughs> uh, the flip class. Uh, whenever I go around and speak now, I've got to uh, give a brief introduction to what the flip class is. The, the, what, what are you flipping? What in the world? I'm a flipper, right? So, <laughs> um, so what is a flipped classroom? Well, uh, six years ago, um, myself and another uh, teacher, Aaron Sams, uh, we teach at a small. Actually, I've left the school, but I taught at a small school in uh, Colorado, uh, in the mountains of Colorado. And um, we, we stopped lecturing. We were high school science, chemistry in particular teachers, and I have not lectured in six years, except to groups like you guys. So <laughs> what did we do? Um, well, we asked a simple question. What is the most valuable use of our face-to-face -face class time? 
Okay, the, st the story started, our assistant superintendent, she came back, uh, she came back from a, a break and her daughter was in college. Her daughter said, I love these videos, or these, uh, these podcasts that my professors make. I don't have to go to class anymore. And that's when Aaron and I said, well, what's the value of class time? And so then we said, well, what if we stopped? So we did. So there's a value to direct instruction. Um, you ask that question, what's the best use of our class time? We said, you know, it's, the kids really need help when they're stuck on problems. When they go home from, to school uh, and they're at home and they're doing problem 15 and they're trying to solve the problem and they're stuck, what do they do? They, they call a friend, they give up, or they cheat. That's what they do, right? Those are the three re choices. When you have a flipped classroom, when the kids watch the videos as the primary direct instruction at home, and then they come to class, when they come to class, the experts there, when they're stuck, they raise their hand. In fact, it's even better than that. When they're stuck, you actually know they're stuck, and you're there and right there when they need it. So um, now, there's also a lot of misunderstanding about the flipped classroom. A lot of people think the flipped classroom is just that everybody's always on the same page. Everybody, you know, probably heard of the Khan Academy and sort of their thing. We, we were actually flipping our classes three years before Khan was known about what he was doing. So it, that's sort of one iteration of a flipped classroom. But um, there's pr probably eight or so different ways to flip a class. So something to kind of keep in mind. So what can be time shifted is the big question out of the classroom to increase that value of that face-to-face -face time. I would argue that direct instruction piece, okay? Um, so we stopped and then what happens in the class is magic. I can tell you story after story of, of students who uh, who took responsibility for their own learning. Students who were successful, who weren't successful before. We've got a student who was, was failing out and then came into our class and now is majoring in engineering at a major university. I mean, just story after story of just powerful uh, uh, student interactions. So our quick story um, is that we were um, recording our lectures live. Um, we discovered some software that was screencasting software. We recorded it live. This is in 2006. Uh, we pushed start, stop. We posted the internet. We did it for our students because in our school, actually, the reason we started the flip class, okay, selfish reasons. Small school, the mountains, the closest high school to our school, 45 minute drive. 45 minute drive, then upwards of two hours. Last period of the day, no kids are at school because they're at the bas basketball game or whatever. We were spending hours and hours and hours tutoring our kids after school and devoting our time for all the classes that they missed. We started recording our lectures so we wouldn't have to stay after school. True story. But then, all of a sudden, these mushroomed, and that's when we, we, we recorded the lectures, and then we had that aha idea. We had this idea. Um, we noticed our students were uh, totally frustrated and wanting to give up. That's, you know, they go home, they give up, they cheat, and all that kind of stuff. And that's when we had the idea to flip our classes. What happens in the classroom? That's Aaron, by the way. Um, the teacher is no longer the disseminator of knowledge. Right? They interact with kids. Their job is to walk around, interact with kids. You, we did 50% more experiments. Okay, hands-on activities. We were able to help people like Matt. Matt's a story. Matt's a kid who gets lots of attention in all of his classes because he's, he's not very successful at school. But he was successful in our classroom. Why? Because he got the individual attention that he needed. The flipped classroom personalizes education. And so what we did, um, after one year of having a totally successful, we had results that proved that work, we decided to flip it even more, and we did flipped mastery. So we took the direct instruction. We still left that out. That's why it's red in a circle. Practice and apply. When they got to the end, they had to do mastery. It's a long story on how this all worked, but essentially when they got to the end of the unit, if they did not master the content, they had to go back and get it done the right way. And so now we have an asynchronous environment where the kids are working at different uh, paces, but they actually learn the content. All right. And we think uh, the flip class is a, it's a piece of the puzzle to solving the prob problems of education. I think that if you take um, flip classroom, you take universal design for learning, and you take problem-based learning, and you merge them all together, I think it's a very powerful mix. I think it's a huge stepping stone. As, as we've shared this with uh, teachers all over the, the world now, um, it's a stepping stone for that teacher. If you've got a teacher who stood up in front of his class for 20 years, and that would be me, and lectured, and that was me, and then you decided to show them all you got to do is make these videos, when you make the videos, it's that stepping stone to that deeper stuff. I mean, when we, when we first started, it was all about the videos. And then we realized later on, there's better ways to do this. In fact, that's where the open internet resources. And we think it's a tool, a tool um, uh, for better learning. Okay, so why do I think that flipped class is working? I think it's because it's a, um, it's a grassroots um, educational reform movement, starting from teachers and going on up, okay? Um, flip learning and OER, I think the flip videos don't always have to be made by, by teachers. So as a teacher myself, um, we made all of our own videos. You don't have to make your own videos. However, I do believe 
that teachers should make their own videos. Um, the big question people ask, how do kids get access to the, you know, the poor schools? We had like 20% of our kids who had no internet. How did we solve this problem six years ago? We gave them a DVD, they put it on their TV, they push play. Simple. Um, um, I think the only thing getting in the way of increasing flipped learning is actually uh, professional development. I mean, we need to teach teachers, and I think that's going to uh, be important. Um, our book comes out this summer. Um, just announcing here now that we um, are starting the Flipped Learning Network, a nonprofit, starting actually this week. So um, we want to provide professional development opportunities, conduct, collaborate, disseminate research, etc. So if you want to learn more about that, I'd be glad to chat with you individually afterwards. Um, resources. There's some websites up there for you if you're at all interested in the hashtag on, on Twitter. Thank you. So um, I did this as an Ignite talk. It's going to be my first one. So this is going to move me every 15 seconds. Keep, the, keep it moving. So first of all, just on my overview, the OER game on. Is this kind of the point in time for OER right now? Is this the moment that we must seize? And thinking about the Wikipedia, the, the blackout, the SOPA and PIPA, there was something that the community could rally around. Instead of the community just rallying against something, is this a time when we can begin to rally for something? In many places of the world, social media obviously is being used. We know how it's been critical in the Arab Spring. We now ha know how the open information flow has been critical to make sure people have a voice and that their voices are heard and continue to be heard through time. In places like Poland, and this is uh, um, Alex Tatarski, who's our CC lead, our Creative Commons lead in Poland. He's been working hard with governments to make sure they open up resources that are used in the, for the public for education. And so now textbooks will be openly published under Creative Commons license. Just yesterday, the World Bank announced that they would be opening their repository under Creative Commons license as well, the research repository. So how much, while this is a big deal, when does this become a norm? When are these the beginning inflection points where we begin to change what's happening as a t typical um, society? Encyclopedia Britannica has been talked about a lot. It's no more. Last print versions have been printed. They really fell off the shelf once they announced that. There was a you know, high demand because groups wanted them. But the world has changed, and Wikipedia is now the place where we all get our information. But what we don't know when we go to Wikipedia is that there's an underlying infrastructure. And that underlying infrastructure is the open license. So people don't know that the ability to remix, reuse, and translate is based on the open licenses, which is really, really critical. But for many people, copyright is a little fuzzy, and I dare say this in the law school of Berkman Center, right? Not all of us are lawyers, and law, the law is not always accessible to all. So how do we begin to actually help everyone understand in a much better way what copyright's about? In that regard, not only about understanding copyright, we have to be able to find the gems. We have to be able to find OER. Search and discovery continues to be a problem. So we have the Learning Resources Metadata Initiative where we're beginning to set standards for tagging education content, whether it be free or not. And tied to this is also the issues of accessibility. I know Hal Plotkin is here, and he's rallied this cry for a long while with respect to open educational resources. If we make our content accessible, universal to design for learning, then we have an ability to step into the mainstream in ways that we didn't previously. The Common Core Standards that Hewlett noted yesterday is another mechanism that we can all use to make sure the content's aligned, it's tagged appropriately, and again, quite findable. These are all mechanisms that we can harness. These are structural things that can take place. Here's a student using a, 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 a camera to videotape. This isn't what we typically see in the classroom. While we talked about the flipped classroom just now, this isn't what happens, right? We know kids are not engaged this way, and there are mechanisms that are really critical to make sure it happens. So as we move to alternative forms of credentialing, as we move to badging, whatever it might be, or the project uh, portfolios, these are going to be critically important in these new days about what Joey talked about when we think about learning. But we have systems, particularly in K-12, that are very controlled and calcified. It's really hard to bring this into the edge. So as we think about it at Creative Commons, we're thinking about what are some of the essential elements of a school of open so that we can begin to educate the world about what openness means and be able to create those materials so people can easily use and repurpose them. We're joining with, as an example, the Peer to Peer University, which has a platform where we can begin to place this content and make it freely available. So teachers can begin to teach their students, learners can learn about open licensing and what it means, and we begin to be, have a way to begin to scale. Because right now it's one-on-one -on -one and it's often face-to-face. -face. 
When we think about higher education, how do we disaggregate the teaching and research university? What does this mean now when teaching is, can be deployed in different ways and research happens in new ways? What, is this what does this mean for universities, such as particularly the R1s, as they think about the traditional mechanisms? This is a group of scientists from Mendeley. There's an incredible group of scientists who no longer want to just use the peer-to-peer -peer traditional processes that take so long for their science to get out. But they've come together and created a platform and been very careful and thoughtful about it so that they have revenue generation as well. Here is a new model, Udacity. What are higher education um, institutions thinking about ways when classes used to be held inside the university, now they're somehow being exported and they're being provided in new ways. We also have uh, MITx coming up. What does this mean for the university? And lastly, how do we think about the broader policies? How do we begin to share those policies? How do we begin to collect them as a community so we begin to set the stage going forward? Thank you. So I, I could have I uh, done a whole presentation on all the stuff that Google has to offer in education. And we have YouTube EDU, we have Apps for Education, we have uh, Google Search. Um, but I, I sort of intentionally didn't do that. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of that stuff during Q&A, but I really want to, to avoid that and think about the web more generally. So. So I, I consider myself kind of an advocate for the web. Uh, I'm not a Google advocate. I work for Google. But I really care a lot about the web. And I want a plus one, what Joey said. Um, it's probably good they didn't let me design the plus one button, because that's what it would look like. <laughs> 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 uh, but I want to plus one everything Joey said. I think um, he's absolutely right that the web opens up huge new opportunities to do things in a completely different way. So. And here are a few of them. Like the web lets us reorganize a lot of different stuff. How we come together as a community, how we engage and share ideas, how we engage in politics, how we transmit culture, how we investigate the world. I mean, go down the list, right? So uh, here's a few data points from K-12, just kind of leaving aside higher education for now. Um, college students are right now 10 times more likely to take an online course than K-12 students. I, kinda, I take that not to indicate that we need a lot more online education in K-12. I mean, that's sort of an unsettled question. But this points out that the, the higher education context is so different from K-12 right now. We have so much more adoption of the web and, and the internet in that context. And why is that? So uh, between uh, over a period of 25 years, almost every OECD country substantially increased spending um, often spending per student, and, and but very few achieve significant improvements in performance. So I take this to mean that we can't spend our way out of this problem. We have increased demand on the education system. It's increasingly required to get a high quality job. So with these new demands, what are the tweaks we can make to the system to make it more efficient? So 91% of teachers in the US have access to computers in their classrooms. This is from a survey done by PBS. Um, in that same survey, only 22% said they had the right level of technology. So although they had access, they didn't really feel like they had the right level of technology. They didn't have the right tools. Um, this, is, this is that same survey. So look at, uh, look at what the breakdown is of the top tech resources used in the classroom. Do you notice anything about it? They, <laughs> they're all online resources, right? It's the web. The web is what teachers are using. It is the most useful tool. So uh, education is stagnating a bit. Um, there are new demands put on it. And we need systemic tweaks to make it more effective. Um, teachers need more useful tools, as you just saw in the survey. Uh, and the web, has been, the web has been the most useful tool so far. So let's make it even more useful. And so this is kind of how I approach the question of OER, right? What do teachers even need to know about OER? They're already using the web. Why you know, do they need to know about copyright licenses and new models for collaborative development? They need new tools to get things done in the classroom. So the question for us is, how can we make the web more useful? Right? Like, how can we, as a community, make 
the web the most useful resource to teachers and students or to learners around the world? So some ideas. Really big scale. Really, really big. I want to be able to go on the web and find anything I need to know. It's that simple. Any topic, any, any, anything I need to know, I should be able to find it. And not only that, it should be really, really easy to use. <laughs> Extremely easy. Um, and, and so this, uh, there's a, a third point, a gener generativity, right? So what are the new things you can do that you couldn't do before? Um, part of this is, is uh, sort of the semantic aspect of things. How can you pull in resources from different, different uh, repositories? Are there new ways of uh, collecting data about ways students are engaging with these resources? Can we feed that back into sort of a, a generative system? Uh, so what are the new things we can build on top of this? So one, the one question is, should teachers ever hear the words copyright license, right? <laughs> they want to use the web. They want to uh, make their classroom more effective. They want to teach people in new and different ways. Should they have, should they have to worry about copyright status of their works? That's all I have. Thanks. OK, please come back to our wonderful chairs. Now, we have um, about 15 minutes to just have a conversation on the points. And let me try to kick start it with a question to, to John. Because you mentioned that you presented the, the flipped classroom and you talked about the time sh shifting of the direct lecturing and uh, so the videos. And uh, you mentioned that you think it's better if the videos are recorded by the teachers themselves, which um, uh, strikes struck me as, as very credible. Uh, but somehow is in contrast with this idea of a common pool of resources that you can simply take and adapt and uh, reuse. How do you see this tension between doing something highly personalized and having a common shared of resources? One thing that I've noticed with teachers as we've trained them, some, some are very good at making videos and some, frankly, are not. And so that is a problem. Um, but our videos are out there on YouTube, and we've had a number of teachers who are using our, our videos and uh, I can think of one guy, Brett Wiley, in Dallas. And he says, you know, John, your, John and Aaron's videos are better than mine, but my students like mine better because it's me. So, but I still can envision, I wonder if there's a, a sort of a, of a, a meshing of it. What if, what if there was a way that you could have a, a, a two-minute introduction? Now, I've done this, okay? So I taught astronomy and earth science. I'm a chemist, right? So I'm mm -hmm. teaching, I don't know, astronomy. So I found uh, some astronomy stuff, and I found some experts. So I would do a two-minute intro, and then I'd pull in videos and then I'd cut and splice. And I was good enough technically to do that, and then my kids watched that, but I was in the video, so to speak, at the beginning, and then I turned it over to the experts. So I wonder if there's a way to just you know, grab here and there, and I, I chose YouTube videos, I found other teachers' videos, and I spliced them in. So I think that's a way to kind of bring that in, and I didn't think about the copyright when I did that. So. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> good thing. And have you ever tried um, to present the same topic uh, with different videos, with different speakers, different teachers? Um, one thing that was interesting is our students, when we first started making the videos, I did unit one. We actually made them simultaneously. So I, we both did the same videos. And mm -hmm. some kids came to me and said, I like Mr. Sam's video better than yours, and vice versa. And that was fine. It's like, okay, there's another teacher you want to learn from. I'm okay with that. Another thing that we've noticed, too, is that is it was all about the videos at the beginning. But then um, we started to discover some, some OER things, like the, the FET stuff that I, I, she spoke here earlier, or got stood up and span, the, the PHET stuff from University of Colorado at Boulder. They've got these online simulations. They're amazing. And those will teach things because they're interactive. The kids would get up with a smart board, and the kids would get up and play with that. And we said, you don't need to watch the video. You get it. Move on. Skip the video. So the videos aren't the be-all and end-all. It's just one of the resources. Some kids said, can I just read my textbook, Mr. Bergman? And I said, sure. <laughs> I don't care how you learn it, I just care sure. that you learned it. And uh, one more thing, um, how do you capture the feedback that you can have when somebody is watching a video? Meaning, when you have, you're doing a, a direct lecture like now, I, you can see a blank face yeah. and you realize you just used a word that that specific student doesn't know. So you stop say, okay, what, what is it that you didn't get? And I'm sure that something like that happens with videos too. 
And uh, it would be wonderful if there is a way of tagging a specific part of the video, say, just saying, I don't know this word, I don't know, I didn't understand this statement. Uh, do, do you see that as, as useful? I mean, that is one of the problems with the flip class is that there's that, that direct interaction. But what we did, very low tech, no tagging, when the kids came to class, we would talk to, we talked to every kid in every class every day, and we would have this small group of one or two or four kids, and we'd say, all right, ask us a question from the video. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, you know, but quickly we realized which videos we made were not very clear, or which misconceptions kids had, and so it was just a conversation. See, class was a conversation, it wasn't a dissemination, so um, we didn't have a way to tag it and all that kind of stuff. It could be done. We'd love to have somebody figure out how to do that technically. We weren't technical that way, so I'm sure there's a way to do it, though. So, Kerry, I don't want to be necessarily the, the pivot for the conversation, but um, uh, you mentioned the work that Creative Commons is doing, and Alex is saying actually something along the same vein, but uh, he's saying why should teachers less hear about copyright license at all? So, if we can make it invisible, um, if we can make copyright invisible, I'm all for it. I have, as long as we're working within the framework of the law, that's what we care about, as long as we're giving teachers and organizations choices so that they have the freedom to choose. But we don't have to make it um, an onerous process. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the barriers we really have to think hard about and how to reduce because right now you create um, a lesson plan, you create a video, and then the copyright, you know, adding the copyright or the Creative Commons license happens after. It's another step. And then you have to look at it, and you have to understand what copyright is, and you have to kind of understand the license chooser, and, and there's an education process. So before we can get it into the classroom, we have all sorts of hurdles that have to be overcome for the teachers who are very busy, who carry a lot. And so how do we think about systemically um, letting that information be shared. How do we make copyright, which has always been traditionally more the concern of the producers who were the publishers pr prior to us all becoming producers, how do we make it very easy, very digestible in a complex situation because copyright law is complex? It is. Alex, so you, I, I'll pick a specific thing that you wrote in one of your slides when you said that education is stagnating. Um, don't you think that it's... Uh, applying this concept of constant uh, progress, uh, meaning uh, uh, a co constant evolution for education is just like saying, you know, classical music, uh, a famous analogy, classical music is stagnating. Since the 18th century, there's no improvement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was being a bit provocative with that. I mean, we, we do make improvements, things, things do improve. We have, we have new tools that we didn't have before, mm -hmm. but I think we haven't seen the kind of fundamental shift that you would want to see yeah. in this new digital age. We have, like, the rules of the game are changed. And we haven't seen the education system wrap its arms around it and say, yes, we want the web, we want to use this stuff. Um, so so, so um, I, get, I get your point, of course, meaning that there is a potential. Uh, we're still far from fulfilling the, the potential. And I, I would resist a little bit the, the um, uh, attitude of saying everything is changing because some fundamental things in education are not going to change. John was mentioning that personal connection. They want to see the video of their teacher. So some fundamental uh, facts of education will remain the same, but we have room for improvement, and that, I guess, your point. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we have, you know, d down at the micro level, the classroom level, a lot of things will stay the same. A lot of kind of the practices will look this similar to what they had before, but at sort of the systems level, how all that stuff happens and the infrastructure that enables all of it will be completely different. Okay. Any comment you want to make? with respect to each other's presentation? Now, I would say that uh, when we're thinking about the process of educational change, especially with the, in, in relation to technology, so often the technology is given and taught to the teachers. Here's a piece of technology you need to know. And they don't know why, okay? You must start with a pedagogy. You must say, this is how this will help. This is what will do for uh, things for kids. And then they'll say, oh, now it's important that I learn this technology. It, it, te Staff development is done to teachers, not with them, not um, from teachers even. It's from on high oftentimes, and that's, that's never going to work. Yeah, so. I would just like to jump in. I mean, one of the um, comments that I picked up from you is that the flipped classroom was created because it solved a problem. 
Mm -hmm. You used it because it solved a problem. So how do we use OER to solve a problem for teachers? Mm -hmm. And if teachers aren't picking up OER, then it isn't necessarily that something the matter with OER, but there's some barriers to those steps. So what is it that's constraining it? We have to look very nuanced at the situation mm -hmm. below. And then just kind of a last point is that if we think about education, it is the one industry where the productivity has not increased in 400 years, right? Because we've been using essentially the same techniques. And so when we try different things in the traditional classroom, we're not changing any significant levers and we're getting little marginal changes. So if we really want to have significant changes, we need to look to some of the work like the Open uh, Learning Initiative, Carnegie Mellon, where they were actually able to use the online distance classroom in a bit of a blended model so you still had access to a teaching assistant, but the student could go through personalized instruction going as quickly as they wanted. If I wanted to you know, consume that information in about a week and you took two weeks or you took three weeks, whatever it might be, we could accelerate it and it didn't have to be an 18 week semester because we've always had an 18 week semester because it's been, the calendar is built on a Gregorian calendar that we no longer have, right? So there are some ways that we can be think we can be thinking about changing some of those structures. It's very hard in some of the public institutions or some of the um, institutions that exist. You're not going to get those quick shifts, and so you're going to have to experiment on the side and kind of let that bubble up. One, one comment on that, and that's it, it's important to recognize that the issues that o, the barriers that OER faces aren't just unique to OER, and mm -hmm. we often talk about how. You know what are the, what what's keeping OER out of the classroom? A lot of the times, other you know ed tech, uh, uh, online learning, all these other types of ways of doing learning that might not be open, they face the exact same barriers, and we we do ourselves a disservice not thinking of it as a broad movement towards the web and as a broad movement towards using more technology and focusing too narrowly on just this this one segment of it that has a certain sort of model. Yeah, in fact, I was about to ask, uh, what are the main obstacles to the adoption of OER, but more generally of technology? Yeah. Is, is it cultural? Is it economic? When you say that only 22, you know, actually, Alex, 22% of uh, educators think that they uh, have the right level, what do they mean by that? Do you, can you? I don't, I mean, I, I'm not sure what they mean, but I, I have some guesses. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so the question is, what are the barriers to getting getting more technology, more useful technology in the classroom? And I, one of the things I would say, at least in K-12, is we just don't have a really functioning market. We don't, teachers and students don't have the ch chance to choose what tools to use in the classroom. If you're a teacher, you know what's going to be useful. Um, if you're told what to use, if you're told what textbook to use, if you're told what tool to use, there's a chance it might not be useful, but you have to use it because you're told to use it. So if we could give teachers and students more opportunity to have a say in the kinds of tools they were using, we would see a lot more useful stuff out there. Actually, without being at all an expert on international education, but one of the OECD countries that actually improved considerably is Finland. And uh, the Finland approach is giving a great degree of freedom to mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that extends also in choosing the technology they want to use in the classroom. I think particularly if you think about the K-12 segment, we're thinking about a lot of control. The teachers are very controlled. The textbooks that they use and the materials that they use are controlled. The testing is very controlled. And so there aren't degrees of freedom for the teachers to innovate. And so it's a very, in many ways, locked down system that doesn't allow the system that you're describing in Finland. So which means that we need the changes at the policy level, like changing the state level? I keep going. I would, I, would say, I would say that teachers, teachers would love to have that openness to do, to do a lot more choice, but you're right, they don't have it. So. Okay, well, because from, from Europe, the perception is that in the US there is a much greater degree of freedom because in Europe we have this ministerial tradition with a mm -hmm. ministerial national program curriculum that you have to, to follow. And from, from Europe, looking at the US, it's so much more, so much freer. So it's not. <laughs> They, there is a lot of choice at the university level. I mean, there, it's, a com it's almost a completely different landscape. Mm -hmm. but the, the right. Two different ones, so. And I would also say that there are pockets of innovation. There are teachers who yep. are doing great things like Vicky and John and others who have found the room, created the room. It's not easy to do. They typically have to be very creative, innovative, spend a lot of time to do that. So it doesn't create, we create these gems and these sh kind of shining lights that really show us the way that we can go forward. But it isn't something that can be scaled. And it really takes kind of that individual who's able to do it. So then it goes to the policies. How do we free the policies to allow that kind of innovation to flourish? 
Now we have a few minutes, uh, even though there are going to be clusters, uh, and so there is going to be plenty of opportunity to discuss, we have a few minutes to take, to involve the audience, uh, I guess, the gentleman over there. Yeah, my name is Gordon Friedman, and I've started a new nonprofit called the National Laboratory for Education Transformation, and we're trying to figure out these issues, and the two frameworks I would say is K-12 is essentially the British Empire in the United States, you know, uh, back in the late 1700s. Uh, we have to figure out how to throw off the shackles. Secondly, I've tried to come up with a metaphor to use, and I used it in a conference in Madrid, actually, uh, called the fog versus the cloud. And um, so I've been starting to tease that apart. But, but anyway, we're actually looking very scientifically at the issues that make it impossible to scale things in the United States. And although ministries are there doing things in Europe, we're still just constrained in another way. So I have one question for John and maybe Alex. Um, nobody's really systematically looked at homeschoolers, OK? So these are people independently learning. In the United States, the population's large enough. It's in the millions already. Do you guys see anything uh, in the use of homeschooling and OER? Because I think that's a fascinating area. I, 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 we have had a lot of contacts with homeschoolers. At least uh, they, they're interested in the idea of the flipped class where they would actually bring in experts because they oftentimes do not have the expertise to do some subjects. And like in particular what I teach, chemistry, um, oftentimes the, the family doesn't have that expertise and so they've been you know, emailing us and saying, how can I use your videos? And they want a whole program and it's like, I just got these videos, so, uh, so, uh, but there is, I think there's a potential there. So, that. I think from a from a market perspective, it's really hard to reach that yeah. that segment of of homeschoolers, um, and but I, I think there's a huge opportunity there in that if you if there was some way to reach them at scale, um, it's the kind of uh, Clayton Christensen sort of uh, disruptive innovation where you're eating away at, at sort of uh, at the traditional model. Um, so you could do that. And I would also put in like lifelong learners in the same sort of category where yeah. it's, it's people doing self-directed learning. Right, we have time for one more question. Sure. Hey, um, my name's Esther Wojcicki. I'm a teacher, Palo Alto. And one of the number one problems with the OER as I see it is that teachers are scripted today. And they're not even scripted as much as they're going to be scripted because teachers are their salaries are going to be tied to test scores. And teachers are given textbooks. They're given tests. They're given the assess, given everything. And they're just like, OK, here's the textbook. Here's the students. Now you make sure that you just pour it right in. And um, so how do you see um, us getting around this? It is a policy issue, but it's only getting worse because we're focusing on what we shouldn't be focusing on, which is test results. And how does testing enhance creativity? You know, what, what about all that stuff Joey was talking about? You know, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? Um, so that's my question. Hard question. Who wants I, to take it? <laughs> I, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, Plus one. <laughs> <laughs> that said, and um, I've been talking to some policy makers, leaders, superintendents, um, and they're curious about at least the flipped classroom and what they see is, I mean, the, they love it, the fact that it's increasing test scores, so that's important to them. But I also think it gets them away from the mode of, you know, straight delivery of content poured in their brains modality. So at least there's a huge interest in this that I think has the potential to do a lot to at least, you know, you know, it's, it's disruptive. It's not, we're, we're breaking the rules, so to speak, but it's working. So I, I'm not sure that I can't solve all the problems in education. I wish I could. I mean, and I would just I would kind of repeat what I said before, which is that uh, this is not a challenge unique to OER. It's a challenge unique to any sort of new model that that yeah. mm -hmm. is sort of outside the box, right? And and I would encourage this community to reach out to the people who have the same yeah. sort of issues, getting adoption and and overcoming the existing bureaucracy and infrastructure of our education system. Uh, people are dealing with this not just in OER, but in online learning and yeah. in uh, ed tech, all these new spaces, they're trying to deal with this too and, and kind of overcome that, those barriers. I mean, I think you know, the power of the traditional K-12 system is it's very stable, right? It's very, very stable and it's very hard to shift. Well, that worked for a long time. But now as you try to make changes, if you just, I think one of the um, 
challenges is if you just think about tweaking, if you make a marginal change, you're not going to get the shifts that we want. So the question is actually how the system gets somewhat disrupted. And because it's so stable, I think actually the disruption has to come on the side. And it has to kind of grow and show some of the research and show some of the viability. And then the parents and the students and the kids are going to say, I want to be over there. Of course, they're saying that already. If we look at the photos, if we know how kids are spending time, I have two teenagers, what they do inside the classroom and how they spend their time outside the classroom right, is very, very different. They're engaged, they're talking to their friends on the Facebook, they're connecting, they don't pick up the phone, you know, they only text, you know, and so that's how, that's their world, and because the worlds look so different now, we can see the chasm that's there, and the question is, when is that going to create enough of a force to disrupt this very stable s system, and then how do we begin to put that into play? So let's thank our speakers, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thanks to the moderator.